All right. It's, it's my pleasure to introduce you to David Middlebrook. And David and I have known each other almost 40 years, David. My I, God, you were only 12. I know, and you, and you weren't born yet. Um, no. So, David, your camera's not on. I'm sorry? Turn your camera on. Click on yeah. to the right of your name. Okay, hold on one second. I've, God, this was so simple when we did our test run. I know, but now you have an audience, so you're blowing it. It's okay. Okay, start my video. Yep. There I am. Okay, cool. So, y y y you, wh y where did you go to college? I went to Albany yeah, College. Did you go to I went school? to school in the University of Iowa for grad school. <clears throat> Uh, I went to the an university. Art. I went to Albion College for undergraduate. I was an art major and a basketball scholarship. And for grad school, I was ceramic major in my master's and a sculpture major in my MFA. I got master's and MFA from University of Iowa. Can you hear me? And all right, so pretty much you've been a sculptor for over 40 years. Right. Well, I would say sculpting with clay for about the first 20 of it. Yes. Do you differentiate between sculpture with clay and sculpture with other stuff? Well, in those days, it was very strongly distinguished uh, between the two because <clears throat> I, I decided to major in sculpture with ceramics, and no one had ever done that. Everybody else in the program was making pottery. And so I was kind of left out in left field. So all my committee was actually painters and sculptors with one ceramic guy. And I'm not sorry I did that because it turns out quite accidentally I was kind of a pioneer. Uh, on the West Coast, there were people that were looked upon as artists and sculptors who worked in clay, but nowhere else. You know, Peter Volkus and uh, Robert Arnest and people like that. <clears throat> but uh, even the other well-known ceramic artists were still potters, like Paul Soldner and uh, Kenny Price and, you know, Ron Nagel, people like that. So, uh, but I always felt it was the material of choice because I, it suited my my skill set and it suited my sensibilities the best, but I never thought of it as pottery or ceramics. To me, I always thought of it as sculpture. You never really stayed within the limits of what people tended to confine ceramics to. No, never. I painted it, I sculpted it, I sampled it, I sawed it apart, I, uh, I used a lot of, uh, I had no reverence to it as a ceramic craft. And it was an advantage from an artist's point of view because I was kind of a rebel, but it was a disadvantage from the purist who thought, well, this guy's not really a ceramic artist. He just rapes and pillages clay and comes up with these weird things, and uh, we don't know where to put it. So is, in this happen. piece that we're looking at, can you see your desk, your um, website? Oh, yeah, I see it. Yeah, that's what happened. I, I thought we lost you. Yeah, I can see it. What, 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 is there any clay in here? No, but I still use clay in my process, but most people would never know that. Uh, I started doing public art in the uh, mid, uh, early 80s, and I realized the ceramic process was completely unacceptable. So, but I, I had such good skill sets with clay that I actually used clay to take molds of actual natural objects like branches and other things I find, and I, it's for a lot of reasons. It's faster, it's cheaper, it's more immediate. Uh, I can take a clay mold of something and then put the wax inside and continue to manipulate and bend it. Uh, and then I can, you know, recycle the clay. Uh, it avoids having to drive to San Francisco and buy rubber mold material. It's real, you know, it's it's an expeditious process. And, and I've gotten so capable with it that I, I really don't use traditional materials. I still use a lot of clay to form objects. I sometimes build an object in clay take a plaster mold of it, translate it into wax, cast it in bronze, or some other permanent material. When did you start making public scale art? Uh, 1982 was my first commission. And it was quite, uh, it actually it was kind of a, a, go, a really exciting story because I did a ceramic show where I just come back from Australia. I was a visiting artist in Australia. And there were no glazes or any of the traditional materials I've been used to using. So I did this show of the Australian work. It was all unfired. 
but I did burnish it so it had a soft and sweet surface and a client came along they thought it was stone and so being an opportunist uh, I didn't argue and they said can you make this piece at 10 feet this stone piece can you enlarge it in stone 10 feet and I very uh, un uninformed said oh sure and then I had the problem of finding out where and how so then I researched it and found out to go to Italy is the only place to do it and that was my first trip. So oh, that's and why you went to Pietro Santa in the first place? That's the very first trip, to go and build a piece. And actually the client had a fabulous collection. They had my piece placed between a Henry Moore and a Barbara Hepworth. And uh, this was in 1982 and the client was Bob Noyes, who had just started a small company by the name of Intel. And his wife was Ann Bowers, who was vice president of Apple. And that was a wonderful you know, opportunity to make my work aware, make my work become aware to people in that, in that ball game, you know, the Silicon Valley crowd. So it opened up a lot of doors. So, all right, wait a minute. So you're, you're going to be, we should sing happy birthday. You're 69 later this week or something? Yeah, I've decided to have my final birthday on, on this uh, May 1st coming up. It's the last one I'm going to celebrate. Are you going to die? No, I'm just going to start counting backwards. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I All right, so hit, you, you, I don't want to hit an un, I don't want to hit an unsavory number. <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, but I'm trying to figure out. So for like the first 20 years of career, your career, you made what we in the industry call plop art, right? Stuff plop that, art. Plop. P L O P. Oh, plop. Yeah. You know, I I don't think so because I never ever put things on concrete bases. I wanted them to look like they just appeared or they happened to land there. I did not, not want them to feel like they were anchored or held yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, but like, you weren't doing large-scale commissions where the work was, was oh, made. Actually, I, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, I did objects that were placed and, yeah, you're right. So how but different, I wanna, I wanna, what I want to explore is how different is it working as a gallery artist or, you know, doing stuff for yourself versus doing a sculpture for, a client where you're fulfilling a certain kind of I just, the whole difference. Well, I tell you, the biggest difference is, of course, site. I mean, 99% of the time when you do a commission, it's got a predetermined site. So I find the first job in that process is well, there's two big jobs. Number one, to consult with the local gentry and find out exactly where their mindset is in terms of you know, their sensibilities, their attitudes, their ideas about art, their ideas about culture, uh, what, you know, what kind of uh, tickles their fancy in terms of their, you know, interest level. The second thing is to work with the art professionals that are already on board, the architects, the landscape architects, the developers, and find out where their heads are at. That gives me a sort of parameter. Uh, ah, come on, come on. Are you, are, are, you, are you already the chosen artist? Or yeah, are you? Well, no. That's when I'm in the finals. Okay. That's when I'm in the finals. That's when. And then what I do is I love. I used to love this challenge of making a site-specific work that is specifically for Pueblo, Colorado, or, or Milwaukee, Wisconsin, or you know Seattle, Washington. But I never have ever had anyone tell me or suggest. Even dictate to me what type of imagery had to be used. That I won't do because it was my job to develop an idea with information I had to fit the best I can uh, of, of, to solve a problem with a visual image that best suited the site and had the best connection to the people of that community. So it's a real, you know, it's, it's a challenge, but an exciting thing to do. But you know, in the end, you still always do what you do. I mean, I I'm not a uh, I'm not a hired gun. I got to do what the sensibilities of my own ideas and my own art, and I think it's an interesting challenge to go into a place and use your ideas to fit their needs. And when I say fit their needs, make something that's appropriate for the site. You see a lot of public art that has no connection to the place it landed, and that always offended me. I call it visual pollution. I mean, you see it in architecture all the time. It, it much oh, as yeah, it, for sure. It's very much like the job <laughs> of an architect, you know, to make a suitable place that fits the ambiance and the lifestyle and the integrity of the area, and at the same time, 
welds and melds with the space and creates some kind of a uh, interactive opportunity for the viewer. I don't think visual art in the public sector should turn people off. I think it should make them happy that they went ahead and spent the money to do that. I mean, sometimes you really have terrible on the ground experiences. Like one time in Pueblo, I did this enormous piece. It was a 28 foot, 15 ton basalt piece. And the budget was nothing. It was like 25 grand. And I, I lost money on the job. And at the grand opening, somebody came up to me and said, do you realize that we got your sculpture and we lost two school buses because they couldn't afford them? And I said, well, then have the kids walk to school and have them walk by my piece and tell them there's your buses. <laughs> I mean, that, what they didn't realize is it was NEA money. It had nothing to do with their, their budgets. And it happened to be the same cost as two school buses, but that was from a different budget. But people don't realize that. Never. So uh, how, does it, how does it affect your, I don't know, here's a loaded question. What about career ambitions? What is it you've wanted to accomplish? What is it you still want to accomplish? Have you? Okay, I'd say the only career ambition that myself and many artists I've talked to ever have, and that is to at least get recognized for as good as you actually are. I've never wanted to have success unmerited, and I've never wanted to be unrecognized if I did something really important and significant. Uh, I think it's just a fairness, fairness within your own capacity. I mean, we all know there's artists, we all have the problem that there's many artists out there we know are better than we are, they're more capable than we are. They've done more amazing things than we'll ever do. But at the same time, we know we've done some things that are fantastic that may or may not have been recognized. That's, that's all I've ever hoped for, is to get acknowledged for as good as I actually am. Now, I'm not sure how good I actually am, but I, I think it's important to at least uh, have some people recognize, which has been happening to me more and more in the last decade, that this stuff is, is unlike anything anybody's ever done. And that's all that matters to me, really. Uh, as far as uh, financial ambitions, I just, I've just i always wanted to make just enough dollars more than it takes to make whatever I can think of so that I have a few dollars to move forward with the next idea. You know, uh, these prices that you hear today in the art market are absolutely astonishing. It makes you think, these people aren't artists anymore. They're branders. They're stockbrokers. They're they're venture capitalists. They're they're almost everything but artists. You know, the Damien Hurst, the uh, Jeff Koons, $50 million for a piece of art. I mean, it's as disgusting as hearing the prices that ballplayers are getting for $100, uh, you know, $100 million for a five-year contract. These, these things are crazy. It's, it's all about the same economic disparity that we see on Wall Street and with CEOs. It's it's one of our financial liabilities in this country. Is uh, that's true? All right. So how how does how, how does the public art making and I mean I, I don't feel like you've been making large scale public art and having making gallery art. You haven't done both at the same time very often. Is that right? Yeah, I think it's really tough to do both. Uh, all the period that I had doing public art in the mid '80s and early '90s. Uh, Financially, it works out pretty well. It allows you to have enough cash flow to keep making the next project. But the problem is you don't get any recognition. You don't get, you know, magazines don't cover you, uh, reviews, articles, uh, critics don't really care. Uh, it's more like a business. You're more like a contractor than you are an artist in, in the art world. But then the gallery, the gallery art world is, is terrific as long as you get good representation. And you know, I've had my share of good. I had a terrific gallery in Chicago for years, but the guy burned the building down. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure how that worked out. But anyway. Uh, it worked out all right for me. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, uh, I've got a great gallery now in San Francisco. She's very aggressive. She's very uh, terrific at marketing. She's had my work in, you know, all parts of the world in the last couple of years. And we've had terrific success. And. Uh, that's been exciting. And it, and All right, so come out, come out, come out. See if you can turn your camera back on. Okay, I don't know why it's off. And um, let's see, uh, where do I go again? To the right of your name on the list. Well, that's not how I did it last time. Let's see. Let me put this large again. Okay, start my video. There it is. Okay, so now. 
All right. So, with, with what you know in hindsight, would how, would how would you balance doing public commissions and doing and maintaining gallery relationships? What 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 what's the right thing for you? Okay. The best way to handle that is to actually I've accidentally kind of backed into it. I had about 10 or 15 years experience doing public art. Uh, during that period, there just was no time, no energy to have an ongoing uh, body of work that could be shown in galleries. So that worked out fine because actually the galleries in San Francisco, my area, really kind of went south during that period anyway. But that's actually where a lot of artists went. A lot of artists were doing public art purely because the gallery system had kind of collapsed. Uh, but now that I've got all that experience of public art, it helps me in making what I would call, you know, smaller and more, uh, you know, transportable pieces. And out of, as a result of that, now I am getting some commissions where people see the gallery, the work in the gallery, and they want to expand it to another scale. Or would you do something for our building that's in the spirit of this? And uh, so I'd say you get established in the gallery first and get your name out, get known. And then the commissions, you can pick and choose. You're not dependent on it. And that I think that's the best way. And that is now what's happening to me. I'm having a few commission opportunities as a result of galleries. How did this relationship with the gallery in San Francisco happen? To my, to my way of thinking, this is the best gallery relationship you've ever had. I think it's been terrific. You're right. Uh, what happened is uh, she was starting a new gallery, and I, my name was brought to her by several people. She said, I want to know who the best sculptors in the area are. And my name came to her by two or three different sources. So she approached me and we hit it off. We liked each other. We, we talked well. We uh, communicated well in terms of our goals. As, as, uh, and she immediately told me, she goes, I'm not going to take any artist in this table that I don't intend to put on a world stage within two years. And she's done it. She put her name over her mouth with I researched her background. She's got a lot of experience with startups. She worked with venture capitalism. She was a collector. And also, she had a terrific background in marketing. And she knows how to write press releases. She knows how to, uh, to get the system aware of you. She knows how to deal with uh, publicity aspects. She understands the value of spending money on an artist to invest in their career. And uh, she believes in the art fair system. She's been to about 10 art fairs in the last 18 months. She's just a very ambitious, very uh, motivated person, and that's the kind of gallery you want to work with. Somebody who's excited about getting your work out there as you are about making it. How many galleries are you working with? Well, I had three when I met her, but she's been so uh, uh, ambitious that the other galleries are really just kind of like, they're, I don't know what they're doing. I mean, they've got a few pieces here and there. They're kind of staggering. She's like a heavyweight fighter, and she's in the round with a bunch of featherweights, and they're all kind of reeling and trying to figure out what to do. Uh, I'm happy to have this one association because she's had so much success. She's talking about opening a gallery in San Francisco, I mean, in New York. And if that's the case, and we've done a lot of shared shows. I'm in a show right now in Aspen with a gallery that she's partnering with. And next year, I'm having a show in Paris with a gallery she's partnering with. And she's also going to partner with a gallery in uh, the Amalfi Coast in uh, uh, a beautiful town, which I can't say the name. Uh, I want to say uh, Pistola, and that's not it. But anyway, it's on the Amalfi Coast in Italy. So she's got three or four world galleries she's partnering with that we're going to end up having shows. So, you know, I don't need other galleries when I've got a gallery like that. And what's, what's going on next month? Uh, next month, I'm going to be featured uh, as a visiting guest artist at the Venice Biennale. I'm also going to be showing with a major installation of six new works at the Basel Art Fair in Basel, Switzerland. And I'm installing a 25-foot commission that I got by way of the gallery in Bordeaux, France. So I've got a lot on the plate. Um, that sounds cool, man. Um, Very cool. <laughs> A good, good life when one jet lag leads to another. <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. Who's got questions? I got more. For, I can always come up with questions for David. Andrea has a, a question. Of, I think. Go ahead, I Andrea. See a lot of nice, I see a lot of nice faces at the bottom of my screen. Hi there. Hi. <laughs> 
Hi, David. Thanks for um, talking to us. I sure. uh, love seeing images of your work, and it's um, really exciting and fabulous. And Thank I you. have to ask, they look um, like these are larger pieces than, than people will tell you you can sell from galleries. So um, did you start out this gallery relationship with these really large scale sculptures, or did you start with the what's considered more marketable? Oh, uh, okay. I've had this, the gallery is in like a 12 foot ceiling, 5,000 square feet. I would say there's only maybe two or three pieces in some of those images that you saw that won't fit in the gallery. But I'll tell you what she does. She has all my work on file. Clients come in, they see, you know, pieces of the same genre, and she immediately shows them other possibilities of the same uh, generation of work that is then, you know, possible for outdoors installation. We have sold some large outdoor pieces that never pass through the gallery walls. But generally speaking, uh, the works that sold through the gallery are the ones in the gallery. But I've had up to 10 and 12 foot pieces in her gallery. So uh, those pieces are a little larger, but not too much. The biggest problem is not the size, it's the weight. I'm sorry? So, yeah, and she actually finds a market for those? I mean, I hear a well, lot of people who, who want it to be the sort of coffee table size work, you know, the mantle. I'm, I, make, I make smaller pieces as well. We've actually had very little success with the small pieces. Uh, there's a lot of artists that make small pieces at a much more affordable price. I, I think the small pieces are overpriced compared to the value you get on the prices on the larger pieces. So I think she's focused more on placing the larger scale work of mine uh, because there's fewer people that do it and do it well. And so, uh, I don't know, I can't explain it. We have sold some small pieces, but uh, it, the, the larger ones seem to have sold better. See, I don't like bases. I actually detest them. I think uh, I try to make works appear to have emerged out of the space that they find themselves either off the wall or out of the floor. And, and I really am quite against the whole idea of a base because to me, the base is kind of like a visual interruption between the viewer and the experience of the artwork. I try to make sculpture as much related to installation as possible. Because I really love huge installation environments, but of course they're very impractical to market, almost impossible to sell. Yeah. Uh, I've done a lot of them over the years with my students as a sort of laboratory of learning, but in the end, uh, the, the learning process for me doing installations is figuring out how to uh, activate a space with a group of images that produce an art experience. And that might be called sculpture, it might be called an arrangement, it might be called an installation, it might be called a lot of things. But in the end, it's, it's the same experience you have when you walk through the woods. Can you imagine going through the woods and seeing the beautiful plants and trees that you see on bases? I mean, how weird would that look? Well, I want art making the art experience to be like that kind of experience, like walking through the woods or seeing a waterfall or a, a rainbow or, you know, if the rainbow had a wire that it hung on, that would look pretty weird, you know. So I, I try to eliminate any kind of interruption between the experience and the object. Thank you. Thank you. Was, that, was that another question, Andrea? So suddenly I can't hear her. Can you hear me? Uh, David, our... can you hear me? I can hear you. David, this is uh, another David, and um, I had a question for you. First of all, thanks for joining us, and I'm so excited both by your work and by your background because I am also have an MFA in ceramics and make sculpture. Oh, cool. So. I, it sounds like, especially with the gallery that you have now, that you probably don't have to do a lot of uh, marketing yourself because, I mean, you have this sort of dynamo doing it all for you. Uh, before then, did, did you spend a lot of time having to do marketing? Did you hire people? Did you, or have, also, do you hire an assistant to help you with your work? Well, I have assistants that help me all the time, absolutely. I mean, I've had... Probably since the very beginning, one way or another, I've had assistance. All through my ceramic career, all through my sculpture career, my public art career, I've always had help. Uh, I was a university professor for 40 years. Uh, people actually would approach me on a daily basis, practically, wanting to know if they'd come to my studio and help. So 
I've been very fortunate in that regard. Most of the time they were grad students. Uh, many times they were people after grad school because they were looking for work and didn't have it. I've had some assistants that have been with for me as long as 10 and 15 years. Some continued uh, their careers. In fact, most. Uh, most were teaching part-time at a junior college and working for me on you know, off days. Uh, the, the older I get and the bigger my ideas get, the more help I need. So I'm not hesitant to, the only problem I have is there's certain aspects of that, the work that I alone have to do. One is patina. I do all the wax work, work myself. I do all the detailing, all the, you know, precision work myself. What I have people do are things like uh, welding uh, things together. I'll have them weld them, I'll chase them, because I want to do the final. I pretty much have a policy where I am the last person to touch the work. So all the build up to the final surface, I get a lot of help with. But the actual final surface of almost every single piece, I'm the one that's handling it. Like if I'm doing a wood piece, I'll have it rough carved, then I'll fine tune it. Or if I'm doing a uh, you know piece in fiberglass, I'll have them do all the primary sanding, but I'll take it down the final step. Because it's usually a surface that I want control of, and I, I, I can't even tell somebody how to get it, because I don't know. i got to find it as I do it. And by the way, I like your little white beard. That's kind of nice. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, I'd love to really pick your brain about a lot of things here, and I'll, I'll stop for now. But it just sounds like a lot of what you're doing, and I'm also teaching at a college and try and figure out how to juggle that. I'd love to figure out all sorts of things about transitioning out of that. So. You want to help me part time? Let's talk about that for a minute, David. Huh? Yeah. Let's talk about teaching or transitioning out of teaching. What? How yeah, David. Work? How long did you, David Middlebrook? How long, I'm, I'm muting you, David Hogan Hooker. Okay. Um, Middlebrook. How long did you teach, and when did you stop? Uh, I stopped in 2010. I started when I was 24 years old at the University of Kentucky, 1970, and I left in 2000. 10 when I was 64. And that was 40 basically years. because uh, I like the sound of 40 years. Yeah, 40 years. That sounds good to me. Uh, I made sure that teaching never, ever was a job or even an interruption in my art making. I thought of teaching as my hobby. And I would actually take whatever I was working on at that time to school with me in my truck and pull up the I'd unload that and I'd show my students what I'm up to and show somehow a way that it would connect to what they're working on with a steel, wax, lip steel. I would have enough work going on that I could bring something to school that would be directly applicable to their current uh, direction that they were trying to solve problems in. I never gave assignments. I always gave a lot of freedom, but I gave them challenges in terms of, you know, we need to have this much work done by a certain time. And then we'll have a uh, progress critique or we'll have a uh, an exhibition. And I tried to get them to understand the importance of sharing their work with other people. So every semester my students, was, it was usually advanced and graduate students because I was a senior professor so I could, you know, get the best classes. We'd always have an exhibition somewhere. So that gave them a work goal. And I made them uh, try to be aware that uh, exhibiting your work and getting ready for uh, exhibition and preparation and installation and presentation are all part of it. The work's not even finished until you can share it with other people. So I, I just literally made teaching an extension of my studio work. I'd bring them to the studio a couple times a semester for demonstrations on things that I couldn't bring to the school. And they, they really enjoyed that. Sounds good. All right. Who's Dana. Dana's on first. Go ahead, Dana. Hi, David. Um, I was wondering when you were talking about getting public commissions through uh, your gallery exhibitions, um, does your gallery then get a percentage of what you're paid for that public commission? Oh, you bet. You bet. And that actually is a problem because uh, this is good you brought this up. Because when you take a piece into a gallery, you know what your costs are to make it. Uh, let's say you use some expensive pieces of bronze or even gold plating, something like this. This affects your price structure, and then you basically talk it over with your dealer, and together you guys decide somewhere between what you'd like to get and what you think the market can bear. Well, 
Well, the problem with the commission is the price is just set before you even make one dollar, before you spend one dollar towards building it. So you run a high risk that it'll cost you more to make than you could possibly get back because you just don't know. Some things do cost more and you can't control them. There are hard figures like shipping, steel costs that, that don't, uh, they have no flex in them. So for the dealer in advance to set a percentage, which is safe for them because they're going to get that money no matter how much you get, I think it's actually a problem. Uh, and this is something that she and I are working on together to try to come up with a formula that works for both of us. Um, we've only done one commission together, but it was a big one. And uh, it came about as a result of her spending the money for the booth at the Basel Art Fair in uh, Switzerland. So I felt she deserved practically the same commission that you would get in a, in a normal sale because it was pretty much the same cost for her because the work, you know, uh, I mean, you could make a hard and fast rule. Anything that goes in the gallery is either 40 or 50 percent. Anything that never gets in the gallery but the dealer sells, it should go at a lower percentage, maybe 20, maybe 25. Uh, but it's, it's something you have to negotiate on a case-by-case a -case basis, where the client is, how visible, the, uh, what's it going to mean for the future. The collection that I'm going in in uh, Bordeaux has Barry Flanagan, uh, Richard Serra, uh, uh, Alexander Calder, and a couple other really big international artists. To me, no matter what was the cost or the loss, that collection is worth being in. So that's why I'm real happy about this commission. You don't make the same amount on every single project that you do. Some of them are what I call sacrifice jobs, where you actually either break even or lose money to have the opportunity to do it. But then hopefully it'll lead to something else. <laughs> the most happens. exciting thing for an artist is the best thing you're going to do. That's the most exciting thing. It's never the money. Okay. Um, I don't know, MacArthur, you have that question before. Do you have one now? MacArthur. I'm thinking about that. I'm. Oh, I, I didn't hear. Who's speaking? MacArthur froze. I, like I don't know if he has a question or not. MacArthur, oh, you got a question? Yes, I see him. Not yet, Paul. Okay, Not cool. Yet. Okay. I muted you again. Thank you. And John, did you have a question, John Edding? I'm sure I'll ask, I'll ask a question. I feel like <laughs> okay. this is a Tucker show. <laughs> um, I didn't have my hand up, but I do have a big question for you. Okay. okay. I started, um, I've been interested in art my whole life, and um, at the beginning of this year, I decided that maybe it was time for me to come out and be an artist. Okay. You know, I've been doing art my whole life. One of the things I've found since I started doing this is there are more artists out here than you can shake a stick at. It right. seems like every tenth person is an artist. But we live in a world where we see things like, you know, a Chuck Close painting is going for a million dollars. And I can look at work by other people that I could get for nothing. And why is this, and is it a good thing? And what in the world is going on in the art world where, where we got this kind of money getting thrown around? Well, well, we've got a whole bunch of artists starving to death. And I'm wondering well, what you have to say about that. Well, I think I, I addressed that issue earlier when I said that some artists are, t I mean, like Damien Hurst and Jeff Koons, you know, they're, they're, the, they're the extreme end of the spectrum. They're getting 50 to $60 million for pieces that 10 years ago they were getting, even then was high, but half a million for. Uh, the question is what drives the art market? What, yeah. what uh, forces these prices to astronomical levels? Well, it's the same issue that we have in every other aspect of the economy. You know, CEOs are, you know those guys, they got busted for the uh, the uh, the fiscal problem in 2008, and were bailed out by our, our government, our tax dollars. They still got enormous bonuses when those companies went belly up. How do you explain that? It, that's absolutely fraud to me. It's fraud in the American public. So I think there's fraud going on in the art world too, as far as uh, overpaid prices for certain things. 
Who can explain it? There was a guy recently that just got busted for uh, some kind of insider trading, and he had his court date set, and there was no question but what he was going to do some jail time. While he was waiting to go to jail, he paid $157 million for a Picasso, and he also bought a townhouse on an island in Florida. And well, how can a Picasso be worth $157 million? Mm -hmm. And I agree with you about Chuck Close. I think his price is – the only thing I can say is – there are people out there willing to pay it, just like there are people willing to pay $250 million for A-Rod to play for the Yankees, even though he's an asshole. Uh, who can explain it? It's what the market will bear. It's, it, it's economics gone nuts. And I totally agree with you about Star Wars versus these artists that are uh, un, unduly overpaid. I almost wish the alliance would get their heads together and say, you know what? There ought to be a, a, a ceiling. If, if somebody offers me 200000 for this, I'm going to put 10000 of that into the Starving Artist Fund. And if every artist would take it upon them to have that kind of a moral compass and pass some of their good fortune on to the less fortunate next generation coming up, wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be just landmark in terms of economic uh, maverick originality? And only artists can think like that. Stockbrokers will never think like that. And neither will real estate dealers. And neither will developers. I think that would be wonderful. A way of leveling the, the, the field. It's, you know, what's the difference between 140 and 150,000? Not enough to think about. Pass it on to the next group, you know? I mean, do something benevolent. Maybe your grandkids won't get rickets or whatever, <laughs> you know? I mean, that, that, I give a lot of money away, actually. In fact, I've set up a college fund for all seven of my grandchildren uh, as a result of some of my you know, good fortune in the last couple of years. And I think that's how it should be. I think we should share and, and make sure that the future has a future. My poor kids can't even afford to buy homes in California. If I had enough money, I'd help them do that. Well, you know, my wife's a poet. So. Oh, and good. You 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 think artists are in tough shape? Try being a poet. My brother's a poet. And I know. They they have a thing where they say, you know, there's lots of poets out there. This is I'm, I can't remember. They say it more eloquently than I can. They, there's lots of poets out there, but they all matter. You can never oh, yeah. have too many poets. And I'm yeah. worried about what's happening in the art world because. We become sucked into this money machine, and you know you got people who are starving to death. Think their work is not worth anything because it's not worth sixty million dollars. And geez, you know, I I've seen an awful lot of great work, and it isn't necessarily coming from people that are making a lot of money. Sure. Well, you know, you can look at a lot of stories, like the Basquiat story. You know. Yeah. He was a drug addict on the streets of Manhattan, starving and, you know, practically on the verge of overdosing most of his life. And he got discovered, and overnight he was a celebrity, made a lot of money, but it didn't stop him. He still yeah. overdosed. So I don't know. Maybe we got to try to do something about it. Listen, the, you know what scares me more than our economic system is the way it's being patterned worldwide. Oh, like in, in Russia, Russia and China, there's like 10, 10 or 15 new millionaires a week that are now becoming big art collectors, and there's this big disparity between the rich and the poor that's the American model. And it's going to reach a breaking point. We don't know what that point is, and we don't know how that breaking point will happen, but there'll be a point at which it self, self destructs or implodes, I'm pretty sure. David, do you feel like your work has gotten more political over the years, your art? I don't think it's gotten more political. I think it's gotten more, uh, it's gotten more directed towards the issues that I'm deeply concerned about. The environment, everything from wars that don't result in anything except dead soldiers. And, you know, but I don't know if I'd call it political. I've always had a political edge to my work, but I think it's, a little more uh, geared towards uh, environmental issues and issues of uh, extraordinary uh, circumstance. I, I enjoy those kinds of things. 
But I'm also becoming more and more involved with uh, re re-looking at art history. You know, I've done several Duchamp uh, pieces in the last two years. I've done a couple of pieces related to Magritte, related to Picasso. So, uh, I call them re-corrections of art history, things like that. My own interpretation, of course. Having fun with <laughs> okay. stuff is what I like to do. Thanks. I hear it. That's, I, I knew that. John Forsman, you had your hand up. Did you have a comment or a question, John? Yeah, I just, I just real curious. Did, like, like the one piece that you have, real interesting piece, was real the, of the the floating uh, shipping crate, I guess. Excuse me, but oh, yeah. uh, who, who who buys that? Is, does that well, actually has to be sold yet? Huh? Uh, it's had three or four close calls. I see your name here, John, but I, all I have is a FBI profile yeah, picture. I, I live in the I live in the woods and outside of Seattle, so I'm a short fat okay. guy, but, but uh, not very good. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Well, I, but, but yeah, that yeah. Now, who who does does my so gallery and buy that? No, no. But I will say this: that piece. I'll tell you what that piece is about. Uh, my father used to be a farmer, and when we'd be walking through the fields and I was a little kid, he'd suddenly see something like two ears of corn joined together, like, you know, pronged, or he'd see uh, something going uh, uh, extraordinary from too much fertilizer or not enough sun or something, and he'd say, wow, this plant's going haywire. And so the, the, the word haywire has stuck with me for the longest time. Well, as I've been, you know, paying attention to and looking at uh, things that have happened to our environment in the last 50 years, what I've seen is uh, man's uh, presence and abuses and his uh, inability to deal with all the issues we're all aware of ha has caused so many environmental changes. Our weather patterns are haywire. Our uh, systems of uh, seasonal change where blossoms are supposed to grow at the right time so the larva can be eaten by the birds and the migration of the birds are controlled by that clock. All these things have gone off. So I thought the ultimate thing that could go wrong was gravity. So I thought, well, what's the most pedestrian way to kind of illustrate that? And so I thought a crate full of rocks that was floating away would be an excellent kind of, you know, uh, everyday example of that. So that's what I did. And uh, I've had three or four chances to sell it. It hasn't sold yet. Uh, it's not real inexpensive, but it's not incredibly expensive. It's about 100 grand. And it's 16 feet high, so it's it's a pretty big piece. You can walk under it. You know, it's great in a public park. It's very safe. It's been outdoors for about two years in a in an exhibition in Montavo, uh, California. And uh, you know, someday it'll sell. It'll end up somewhere. But I love the illusionistic quality of it. I love the uh, the the otherworldly quality. Now, mom and pop wouldn't buy this, but uh, if mom and pop hit the lottery, they might. Do you make these in editions or are they unique? Uh, I've actually done some edition pieces. Uh, the two pipes joined together are in, in an edition of three. Um, I kind of got that idea from Rodin. I, I, you know, I go up to the Cantor uh, Museum up in Palo Alto fairly often, and every single piece Rodin did, he did at least three or four editions. And when a certain piece appeals to me and I feel like it deserves to have more than one exposure, I will do them in an addition because I only do it when I had to make a mold in the first place to get the image to begin with. So then it makes sense to go into an addition. And so I've done about four pieces in addition. There's only one addition I've ever done that's sold out, and uh, that was a smaller piece. All right. Um, Maureen, did you have a comment or question? Um, can I see Maureen? First of all, David, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I don't see anything but my sculpture. Oh. Okay, I'm, I'm, I am in, I think I'm in the frame. All right, we'll get Maureen here. Wait a minute. We're no longer. Oh, right. Goodbye, Art. Hello, Maureen. There you oh, go, yeah. David. Hello, Maureen. Um, you know, it's really fascinating to hear you talk about your art because I would never have understood um, the sculpture that you just explained. And now that I do, it's really thought provoking. It reminds me a little bit of, um, is his name Thornton Dial? Do you know who he is? He did a. a I do. You know, I don't know that. Was with that. And when I, I, don't, I don't know that artist. You do not? 
You like funny. him, David. He's primitive and untrained and makes big, clunky, funny things. Okay. Well, he, has a, he has a really interesting political perspective. It's um, and it's a lot about the environment and the economy. And what was interesting is that I would have never understood anything he did if the show hadn't been well explained to me, for lack of a better word. Right. And I, I'm wondering, do you write about your work? And if you oh, don't, yes, I do. I do, do write about my work. And often when I have a show, there's a plaque next to the piece that kind of describes. The hardest part is to narrow it down to two or three I'm sorry? Because most of my ideas are multiple. I, I call them dense collages. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, that's a real challenge to say in four or five words the meaning of something that has enough depth that it covers the subject. Mm -hmm. I used to have like a 10 page artist statement, and then I got a little older and it was five pages, and I got a little more mature and it was mm -hmm. two pages, and then it got down to a paragraph, and now I have it down to three okay. words. And it's simply make thought visible. And uh, I try to do the same thing when I describe my work. Okay. You know, I'm really sorry. I had a really hard time hearing that last part, the three words that you said. Uh, my artist statement is make thought visible. That's cool. Okay. Very good. Make Thank thought you. visible. That's good. Okay. Thank you. Well, I find that people make thought visible. You know, I find that people don't read more more than two sentences, so why make it longer? And besides, they, I can't think of anything to say that's a lot longer without repeating yourself, you know? Are all these people in the class artists, Paul? Yeah, everybody's a visual artist. Cool. And the Thank seminar you. is, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Marie. Mm -hmm. And they're from all and over. And there's some people with hands up, like MacArthur, who's, yeah, they're all over, mostly all over the United States. Sometimes we have people from other continents and countries. I don't think we do tonight. So you're well, alone. Arthur, did you have a question yet? Yes, I do, Paul. You're alone okay. alone what, David? I'm alone, alone in my alone office. In the room. I'm alone in my office, and, and all these people and, are. And that's funny. Like, we're, yep. all alone, we're, all alone, we're, all, we're all alone, but we're all together. That's right. It's. I'm telling you, it's like I'm, the Tucker I'm, Show. <laughs> the Tucker Show? That was a car? No, that was a movie. We, about know, a car. car. So, Carrie, what was his name? Uh, Carrie was in a bubble. Oh, that's right. Wait a minute. That's not the name of the show, though. Was it Ed? The Truman oh. Show. The Truman Show. Truman Show. Okay, MacArthur, bring David back to sanity. Go ahead. Hi, David. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for being with us. Nice. Sure. Uh, I'm interested um, in how you, um, through your um, maturing process, brought your artist statement down so succinctly to four word, to to three words. Um, what advice do you give to your students with their artist statement? Yeah, kind of the same thing. Edit, 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 and then you know. Read, read, edit, edit, read, read. Think about whatever is in there that's fluff or uh, less uh, essential. Pick out the most essential things and then underline them and see what you can do to get rid of the stuff that's in between and just keep working it, working it, working it. It's like art, you know. Some of the most fantastic pieces are so simple. Look at Calder's mobiles mm -hmm. or look at Brancusi's uh, pieces or look at, you know, I mean, we spend our whole lives as artists going through two periods, back and forth, additive and reductive. We add, 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 we reduce, reduce, reduce. We add, 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 we reduce, reduce, reduce. And you look at an artist's career and it's like a parabolic bell where they're putting too much stuff in and then they're spending the rest of the time getting rid of all that stuff. And then they add a whole bunch more stuff and then they get rid of a whole bunch of stuff. And so as they mature and get older, you'll find that it becomes more and more simplistic and more and more uh, to the point. And I think the artist statement should follow the same kind of rules. Uh, you know what Magritte said that was really fantastic? He said, uh, oh, suddenly everything went away. Oh. Uh, he said, what did Magritte say? Where'd David go? Yeah, where'd everybody go? I just, on its own, it just went gabushi. Magritte said, <laughs> <laughs> 
My only job is to transcend preference. Wow. Which I think is fabulous. I mean, think about it. Yes. Transcend preference. So a guy walks into the gallery one way, and by the time he leaves, he's another way. His, hat, his attitude, his preferences, his choices, his loves, his hates have all changed because of the art. That's a hell of a task. I mean, that's, that's monumental. Yeah, yeah but there's a good David, I can't see you anymore. Turn your camera back on. Okay. I got to, uh, let's see what this does. Stop transcending visuality. There we go. Is that back? All right. Not, yeah, there you are. Okay, cool. Okay. I didn't touch it. I didn't touch it, Paul. I did it on his own. Uh, another thing that McGreet said is, uh, some woman came to him in the show and she said, Mr. McGreet, I've watched your work for years. I want you to know I really understand what you're trying to say. He said, Madam, you are more fortunate than I. And I think that's very true of artists. Some of our best work, we have no idea where it came from. We don't have any idea what it's about. But we knew we had to do it. We had to put it together the way we did. Because that, that was the thing that was, you know, why would you make something if it's already there? We make things because we see them in our minds, but they don't exist. I mean, that's what artists do. Now, art people that make artistry make art that looks like art. That's a different kind that of That was weird. I totally disappeared. I don't know what I meant. I had to come back as a different person. Yeah? Paul Klein's over here on the left, and Paul Klein's right here in the middle. I know. There's two of me. That's weird. You finally got <laughs> cloned. Can I have one of you out here on the West Coast? I could use you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Does anybody else have a question or comment? I just saw Annie going to another room. That's cool. I feel like this is a surveillance kind of a deal. It can be. <laughs> now we got Paul. So, Collins David, 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 David. Yeah. your career is about as in good a place as it ever has been right now, wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And wh where would you say it was five or ten years ago? Uh, you know, regionally, nationally, in pretty good shape. Uh, um, didn't have much exposure in Europe. Now I've had kind of a world stage that has been, you know, presented to me in the last uh, four or five years. And I had a show in Bangkok. Uh, I had a show in Australia. Okay, yeah, but why, five, 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 five. we know you're cool. Show I'm out. I'm not, all right. I want to know how you balance. How do you? How do you? How do you keep a good attitude during the not so prolific times? How do you, you know, how do you stay humble in the good times? Uh, I just love doing the work. And it's kind of a cliche, but it goes back to that Kevin uh, Cosner movie. You build it, they'll come. You know, just do the work, do the work, do the work. And if you believe in it, and if you put your heart and soul into it, you will be found. Now, I mean, a lot of people think you got to market yourself. Well, I don't think artists as a, as a group are very good at that. Uh, some are good. Some are horribly good, like Jeff Koons. He's not even a good artist. He's just a good marketer. But uh, I think that people will hear about it. People will see it. You know, it happens. Word travels. Just do, do the most extraordinary thing you can imagine that you are personally able to, to pull off, and you make noise and somebody will come along and discover you, and before you know it, things can happen in a really good way. The hardest thing to do is make the second one after you've made a really good one. Yeah, that can be hard. But you should always, yeah, that's very hard. And I, I've always told my students, work on the edge of what you know. Don't work in the middle of it, work on the edge of it. You know, it's like, if you think this will work, try it. If you know this will work, don't bother. Go to the one you're not sure about because you got to stay edgy. you got to stay edgy because you know what? There is no – I don't think it's possible to, to think – to actively think through and make original art. I think what you do is you make the best work you can make, and you're the only individual that's ever been you. And if you make that well enough, chances are there's something about that that's going to be original. So it's all about finding that avenue or that corridor – that leads you to the most of what you are. And then, you know what? You can't fail with that system because you did it. Nobody else could have done it. So there's no plagiarism involved. There's no uh, uh, 
a derivative aspect to it. It's 100% you. I'd rather be 100% me and be wrong than 75% me and be right because I know I can do it again because it came from me. If I'm a phony and I make a really good knockoff so-and-so, what am I going to do next? That, there's a truth about that. It's the best part of art. Art, you know, Picasso said, he said, art is, the, art is a lie that tells the truth about life. And I really believe that. So, you know, art's nothing but paper and glue and acrylic. And the real art is what people feel when they're not looking at it, when they've already left the gallery. That's the art. And if you do something so extraordinary and so much you, they won't forget it. And it'll stay with them. And you've touched somebody. You've communicated with your species. You've made a uh, uh, a landing spot. You've suddenly got yourself home. That's what we've all been looking for our whole lives, isn't it? What is really home? Where Where is home? Home is where you're doing the most comfortable thing that is directly about who you are in the most uh, fresh and an easy way because it's you and only you. Nobody else could have done it. Nobody else is about to do it. It's you doing it. And that's what it's all about to me. Yeah, that's a really good I had another question, but that's a really good place to wrap this up, I think. I think. Um, I think. Well. Does anybody want to, does anybody have a better conclusion? Well, I'm certainly available if anybody wants to chat some more. This is All right, I'll ask you a different question. This one's off. It is kind of fun, isn't it? So yeah. you are one of the most successful artists I know who has an offspring who is a successful artist. Yeah. That's I mean, I guess I can think of um, David Smith and who else can we think of? Uh, you're thinking of Tony Smith and Kiki Smith. That's sorry, Tony Smith and Kiki Smith. You're right. I apologize. Who else? That's all right. So your Different son is generation. Jason Middlebrook. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, doing great. So sometimes I feel like you guys are competing, and sometimes I feel like you guys are a mutual admiration society. What's it like? Well, I don't really feel we ever compete. Uh, he and I both admire each other a great deal. The older we get, the less we are like father and son, the more like colleagues. I mean, he's, he's 46 years old, and uh, we've been best friends for 25 years. We were best friends even when he was a young fella. But he had to go away and find his own, his own way. You know, growing up on the West Coast in my studio every day, he would have had no chance whatsoever to be successful as an artist. He knew it. I knew it. So he got a, he got an offer to the Whitney program when he was about uh, let's see 1994, the Whitney uh, Artist in Residency program. So he went to Manhattan, and I knew when he left that he'd never be back. But I just looked at the positive side and said, "Great, this gives me a great excuse to go to New York four or five times a year." So it's worked out great for both of us. I do miss my granddaughters. I don't get to see them very often. But Jason and I are on the phone or texting two three times a day. Uh, we share, you know, the computer all, all the time. We haven't done this. We're going to do this next. This is awesome. I love this uh, <laughs> Skypey Doodle thing. And uh, I, I, I couldn't be more proud of my son. I'm, I'm thrilled. You know, if you look at a lot of artists, a lot, I was good friends with Noguchi for a while, and you know, he had a studio in Japan, studio in New York, studio in Italy, and he would just basically go round and round the world, New York, Japan, Italy, New York, Japan, Italy. So we talked about this one day over dinner, and he was telling me he's never married, he has no children, he has three houses, three studios, and all he does is go from one to the other. And I thought, you know, I would not trade having my children and my grandchildren for his success in a 100 years. And I feel really fortunate that I've had a relatively normal family family life kind of situation and then also a fairly, you know, successful career. And I'm real happy in this spot I'm in with both being quite successful. A lot of my artist friends are solo or they haven't had children, didn't think they had time for children or didn't think they had time for, you know, 
typical stuff like mowing the lawn and going to ball games and little league. I find all that stuff to be a part of my species and an important informant in being a better artist because I'm a part of a society where, I mean, I'm making art about life. And if I don't participate in life, I might be isolated from it and miss something. So I like being a sort of ordinary guy that goes to do extraordinary things. You know, I don't put a bolt in my nose and put my hair blue, but I come up with some pretty wild shit. And see, a lot of artists get confused. They think it's all about appearance. No, it's all about substance. It's all about getting grounded and having a solid background and a solid footing. And to me, family is one of the best things to help you do that. But that works for me. It wouldn't work for everybody. I'm not professing that's what you should do. I'm saying it worked for me. That's cool. You know, and I asked Jason something kind of similar, and he sort of said something, you know, sympathetic also. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So, Jen, what do you want to ask? Jen, go ahead. Jen, Jen's turn. Me? Yeah, girl. <laughs> Oh, wait, did I put my hand up? It was an accident. I, um, no, you didn't put your hand up. I'm just calling on you. Oh, okay. Um, well, I, I sent you messages saying that... Um, I, I know what you sent me. I saw them. I, I didn't think I'm calling on you. David, I'm really enjoying uh, listening to what you have to say. I'm trying to write it all down really fast. Um, I just want to keep listening. <laughs> I don't have anything smart to say tonight. Say something <laughs> stupid. <laughs> say, say something Say something you feel. Uh, uh, Paul, you're putting me on the spot. I ate too much pizza. Sitting here. Where, <laughs> where, where do you live, Jen? I live in Aurora, Illinois, about an hour west of Chicago. Yeah, I know it. I know it. Oh, okay. Yeah, and I uh, I have lots I of stuff to the, speak hard about. I used to show up at the Klein Gower in Chicago, so I'm very familiar with Chicago. Okay. Hey, we're keeping this polite, David. Keeping it what? Polite. Well, there's nothing impolite about telling her that I used to show up to Klein Gallery. So far, so good. <laughs> All right, who has, wait a minute. Do we have more questions here? So, I, Jen, thanks so much for your insight. Um, <laughs> Maureen, did you want to comment? I just like to ask um, David a quick question. Go ahead. Okay. What was it like working with Paul? Is it? Is it? Oh, how? Uh, uh, what was it like working with David. Paul Klein? As a, I will. Don't worry. What was it like working with Paul Klein as a gallerist? Uh, I just looking at your resume online. It seems like you have a lot of shows with him. Is it so? I did. <laughs> Let me tell you what it was like working with Paul Klein. It was like Saturday Night Live. Really. We had more fun. <laughs> You're not kidding. I mean, you know, he would, he would, he's a great guy. We had a ball together. Totally supportive. Totally uh, loves art. Loved to help the artist. He was so generous. He would put us up in his, either his house. He would feed us. Uh, we'd stay in town for three or four days. We'd have great openings. We'd go out for dinner. We'd party. And we, that's wonderful, was, so that's why he has so many friends. It was absolutely hilarious. And yeah. he was so supportive of the work. And he actually sold the work. Can you believe it? He actually sold the work. So it was a perfect, I love being in the client. And you know what? It started before that because I was joined Paul in the Rubicon Gallery in Los Altos before he even moved okay. to Chicago. And that was kind of kind of a little more homespun, a little more local gallery, kind of a little village kind of gallery, you know, not nearly as uh, high profile. And when we went to Chicago, I was with the guy as we as he moved to Chicago. I mean, he didn't fool around. He got video equipment. He would video the artists interviewing. He would uh, take clients out to dinner. He'd have beautiful uh, presentation. You know, bouquets would arrive the night of our opening. Uh, he would have back. back Too bad it's breaking uh, up, and we can't hear any more of the BS. Oh, it was expensive. It was like showing in a New York, uh, you know, Soho warehouse. What? I didn't hear you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was terrific. Thanks, I David. I believed every word of that. Thank you. It's true, Paul. You know, you know. Thanks, man. It's true. We had a lot of fun. I we know. Made a, we made I'm a being <clears throat> All right. 
let's wrap this puppy up. I don't. I think we. I think we've got everybody's questions. Okay. Um, David, you've been exciting and you've been thoughtful okay. and you've been um, provocative and I hope you've stimulated some artists. And I love yeah, you well. and um, have a great time in Italy without me. And I'm going to unmute everybody so that they can echo that. Let's see. Unmute. Okay. Oh. All right, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Right. That was great. Thanks, thanks. Bye bye all. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. We'll do it again sometime. All right. Grow up.